various pastors, when they saw the church gathered like this, would say, isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? And it is, and it looks like we're all almost here. Lori, it's good to see that you're here and doing well. I was thinking you might be missing today, but as I look, almost all of us are here. Praise God. Would you consider for a moment, though, that it's not just about being in the house of the Lord, but according to the scripture, we are the very building blocks of the temple of God. We are the house of the Lord. We are the building. And when we're sitting together or standing together like this, we are the place where he comes and he dwells. And he's in our presence right now. Will you sing with me, please? In moments like these, I lift up my voice. I lift up a voice. I'm sorry, I missed the words. I'm sorry, I was getting confused with Spanish, and I had both languages running in my head here. Let me see. Let me pull this up here. Here we go. In moments like these, here we go. I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing. Singing. Sing. In momentos así, levanto mi voz, levanto mi canto a Cristo. In momentos así, levanto mi ser, levanto mi mano a Él. Cuanto te Cuanto Cuanto we love you, Lord. Tomorrow is election day. This arrived in my house yesterday, and it says, El Paso County, no before you vote. Tomorrow's the election day. This is for primaries and also for various offices around the city of El Paso. Oh, Tuesday, March 1st, thank you. Tuesday, March 1st. Um, you can download a sample ballot that has all the instructions. Sample ballot, Texas 2022. You can remember that. Simple ballot or sample ballot, Texas 2022. At the bottom of that ballot, there's two highlighted areas there. You can click on one to see what the Republican ballot will look like because these are primaries. And you can click on the other to see what the Democrat ballot looks like. And you choose one or the other to vote on. But it's your responsibility, first of all, to go. God has given you this. And you've got to do something with it. And it's also your responsibility to educate yourself on, um, on who you're supposed to vote for. And so each of you, please show up and uh, vote your conscience there. I would like to say, please don't vote your billfold. Walking with God can be expensive. Please vote your conscience. Okay? Um, we're uh, picking up in Psalms chapter 7 this morning. Oh, and I should also say, for those of you who uh, may have forgotten or, um, or just missed it, there, the choir practice is right after the service. So if, you, if you're, you're wanting to be in the choir and you dropped out for 
any reason we haven't announced it or whatever, there's a choir practice, a short choir practice right after the service. Is that right, Patty? Am I still? Okay, thank you. Just right here, just stay right here in the sanctuary. Psalms chapter 7 begins, you have a title there that has been uh, a title on this psalm as far back as we can go back historically. Some think that actually Ezra himself titled this song when he was coming out of Babylon and he brought his gatherings of the Psalms, that he's the one who put this title. Other, you know, say that it was something that was put on here when David wrote it, and when he first instituted worship in ancient Israel. But anyway, it says, A Shagayim of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. And so here's what we know from this. We don't know for sure what that first word means, a Shagayim. Some say maybe it's a musical term. Others say it's a poetic term. A, a term, but we don't know what that particular word means. But we do know that there was a guy named Cush who was a Benjamite that had make some, made some accusations against David. Remember that the first king of Israel was not David. The first king of Israel was Saul. And Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, Saul was concerned because David's fame was growing. People were singing, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands, and Saul is looking at David, who is of the tribe of Judah, and he's kind of thinking, this guy is gaining popularity. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. And somewhere in there, one of his relatives, another Benjamite, also was concerned, and his name was Cush. And he came to Saul, and he made some false accusations against David. Remember that David would not lay his hand on the Lord's anointed, David never asked to be king, never wanted to be king, never made a move to be king. All he did was faithfully did whatever God and whatever Saul asked him to do. David was actually one, the, perhaps the most faithful servant in all of Saul's household. But in his innocence, an accusation, a stab in the back, slander was brought against him, and that's what prompts this psalm, this song, this prayer. So we see in verse 1 and 2, David says this, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tell, tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. I want you to notice that Red had mentioned that there is always a lion there. Always a lion there. There is always someone. There is always uh, uh, an ag antagonist ready to pounce. And, uh, and so uh, the way that Spurgeon titles this psalm, he says that this very well could be titled the Song of the Slandered Saint. Has anyone here ever had a false accusation laid against you by a co-worker or a sibling? If, if you really want to see false ac accusations, let mom name one sibling as the executor and the others not. I've seen it happen over and over and over, false accusations. Any saints here that have ever been slandered in the church? A false accusation brought by a brother in the Lord. So Spurgeon said this could be called the song of the slandered saint. Slander is to be falsely accused. It's a very hurtful thing to have happen. First of all, because it always catches you by surprise. It's one thing to have committed the error and be hoping nobody finds out. Then when it hits, you're going, okay, yeah, I got caught. But it's another thing to just be traveling through life, blessing others and blessing the Lord and just enjoying your walk. And all of a sudden, somebody says, I heard this about you. To be falsely accused. Let's uh, begin by looking at the passage of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3. Look with me here. This We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Do you recognize that this is the first slander we have recorded in history? I'd like you to notice that there was a snake in the garden. Do you think there's not a snake in your life? In your family? In your workplace? See, we always get so shocked by this. How could somebody accuse me? Remember, there's a snake in the garden. The other thing I want you to remember, God himself was slandered. And so if God is slandered in Eden, how could you possibly think you're not going to be slandered in El Paso, Texas? Just go ahead, and this is just the way the world is, friends. Let's, let's not walk around like geese. Every morning's a new day. You know, ooh, ooh, you know what's going on? You know what's going on. Another thing that you need to understand, sinners have a strong hatred towards the saints. The lost world does not like us. And that's where slander is going to come from. And in fact, if you want to go ahead and live your life without slander, you, you just need to pack up and go to heaven right now. Because here it's going to happen. That's what, that's what this Psalm 7 is, why it's recorded in the Scriptures. We're going to see, you know, first of all, to understand it does happen. God himself was slandered, so why shouldn't his children be slandered? The second thing in this is how do we deal with it? And so as we follow David through this psalm, we're going to go on a journey from the event, I have been slandered, to how, how I come out of this. And so in, verses, in Psalm 7, verses 3 through 5, look at what David says. David says, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered uh, my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. David is able to say to God, you know I didn't do that. Now here's what I'm able to say to God. You know that although I did that and that and that and that, I did not do that thing. I can tell you right now, uh, I was sitting at a prayer breakfast at the McDowell's house. And somebody from the church came in with a letter that they had written and they laid it out. McDowell says, Pastor, these folks wanted to talk to you about this and laid the letter out and read the letter to me. And it was a letter packed with accusations. My wife was steaming as she sat there and listened to this list, this litany of accusations. When it was done, I said, look, I'm guilty of that and that and that, and, but I did not do that one. I would like you to notice something. I'm still standing, and the person who made the accusation is not. I'm still here. No defense, no nothing, just I was innocent of this accusation. We, we need to live in a guileless fashion. Listen, you want to make sure that the accusations are false. You want to live where you've not gossiped. You want to live in a way where you have been generous. You want to live in a way where you have been, been just in how you handle the things that have been given to you so that when the accusation comes, and this person is saying it, or it's written in some way, or it comes to you, instead of responding here, you look to heaven and you say, God, you know, you know what was in my heart. You know that I did not do what they're accusing me of. This is the first place you need to go. What, what do we do? We try to go to this person. We try to get a crowd. We try to get some people together and say, I need you to defend me. Come here and defend me. What does David do? He forgets about Cush. He forgets about Saul and he goes straight to God. God, you know I did not do that. You've got to live in such a fashion that you can stand before your God and say, Lord, you know I didn't do that. Another thing, when it comes, a person can go, you know what, I lived guilelessly. 
I was very careful with how I handled the money. I was very careful with how I treated them better. I made sure they got the lion's share, and still I'm accused. And you can get the temptation to say, well, I might as well have just gone ahead and done it. Don't do that. First of all, you live guilelessly so that you can say, Lord, you know. Second of all, you continue to live guilelessly because God is the one that is watching, and God is the one that you want to impress, and no one else. The whole world can condemn me. As long as God says, have you noticed my servant, Randy? This is how you live. And David goes straight to the throne of God. He doesn't go to the justice of the peace. He doesn't go to his friends. He doesn't tell them, pick up arms. He goes straight to God. God, you know, I didn't do that. Verse 6 and 7 of this psalm. David then says, arise, O Lord, in your anger. You know I didn't do it. Arise, God. Who is my defender? God. Arise, O God, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. And then David says this, Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assemblies of the people be gathered about you. And over it, return on high. It can seem to us, was God asleep when, this, when, when Cush made this accusation against David? But it seems to David as though God's asleep. For the, for the, the saint's life sometimes, because, because he's not Johnny on the spot to answer exactly when we think, we, can, we, can, we start to feel like, God, are you asleep? Don't you hear this? Your child, I'm your child, I'm under attack. Where are you? Don't you hear this? Let me uh, just read to you Spurgeon's comment on this. God's silence is the patience of long-suffering, and if wearisome to the saints, they should bear it cheerfully in the hope that sinners may their fought by be led to repentance. Why didn't God strike Cush dead instantly? For us, we're looking at it going, is God asleep? Why didn't God strike down that school principal as soon as they attacked me? Why didn't God strike down this person who is accusing me? Why didn't? Because God loves Cush. God loves the school principal. God loves your boss. God loves your cousin who's accusing you. It seems like he's asleep, but what you need to understand is that the the long-suffering, the patience of God, that, that period of time where nothing seems to be happening is God's mercy. It's not that he's leaving you undefended. It's that he's reaching out for the life of your adversary. What does he tell us? Pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies that they might become your brother in the Lord. James chapter 5, Tom and I were talking about this passage of Scripture earlier. James chapter 5 verse 11 says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. See, you all are studying the book of Job on Wednesday night, and you see that Job is left hanging week after week, month after month, perhaps year after year. He's waiting upon the Lord to vindicate him and to relieve his misery, and nothing's happening. And and Job's like, if I could just talk to him. See, it seems as though he's asleep. It seems as though he's unaware of my situation. If I could just get a hold of him, I could just get in his presence, Job finally says, but I know that I have an advocate there. I know by faith that one is already there speaking on my behalf. Where is God? Well, where is God? Saving your foe. And all of creation is watching the child of God under this, these circumstances and seeing the steadfastness of the child of God and saying, well, I don't know about Marxism faith. I don't know anything about Nancy Pelosi's faith, 
but I have seen the faith of a child of God right there. There must be a God, and I want to get to know your God, Mitch. I want to get to know your God, Don. In verse 7, he said, Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. In other words, listen, you're not the only fellow that's been accused. All of the saints of God suffer under this exact same thing. And David is going, let all of the saints who are experiencing this be gathered at your feet. Let the assembly of the children of God be gathered and let us come together as one to our Father and say, make judgment over all of us. Because verse 8 and 11, look what it says. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord. Uh, have you ever found out you falsely accused someone? Have you ever assumed somebody was doing something wrong and you were just certain of your righteousness and you went and said, how could that possibly be? And you get into the facts and what do you find out? Oh, they didn't do that. <laughs> How about instead of judging Cush, David goes, judge me. Maybe you're the snake. He judges over all of his people. Judge the people. Judge me, O oh Lord. But then he says, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. What, what is he talking about here? Is he talking about his innate righteousness? Is he saying, I'm without sin? No, he's saying, I never lifted a hand against Saul. What I'm being uh, accused of, I never did that. That thing I haven't done, done, judge me on that. And then he says in verse 9, oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. Verse 10, my shield is with God who saves the upright at heart. God is a righteous God, judge and a God who feels indignation every day. My wife kind of fusses at me because I chew on too many Rolades. I'll drink too much coffee or overindulge, and she sees me going to the bottle of Rolades because I got heartburn. Basically, this passage of Scripture is saying God's got heartburn every single day. Every day. Because he sees the false accusations against himself every day and against every one of his children. See, in this passage, when, when David is saying, I'm coming with the people and he's going, oh, Lord, judge me according to my righteousness that I didn't do this deed. David begins to see, wait a minute, God is not asleep. He's awake and he's listening. And David gathers with all of the other saints that are waiting for God's justice. He's just standing there with, with the host of God's, uh, of God's people. And, and suddenly David's uh, focus is, is getting adjusted. In other words, when he entered into prayer, he had this on his mind. His eyes were upon this when he entered into prayer. His eyes were upon the words that this snake Cush had said about him in the ear, whispering in the ear of King Saul. But now, what is what are his eyes looking on? His eyes are looking now upon the God of the universe sitting on the judgment seat. He came in with this. But when you turn and you see that, what happens to this? It just doesn't matter anymore. In fact, because God is awake, and because God is sitting on his throne, and because God does have heartburn every day, I can just leave this right there at his feet, knowing that he'll take care of it, and I can go back about my business and start living my life again. I don't have to hold on to that indignation that has been given to me. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to worry about what is he going to do next. 
I've left it at the feet of the judge of the universe who happens to also be my heavenly father. And what I can say to Cush is, buddy, I'm praying for you because there's somebody really mad at you. And Cush can go, well, you know, I don't care if you're mad at me. Oh, I'm not talking about me. I still remember one day uh, I talked to the, the used car salesman when when uh, it was West Side Dodge over on Mesa Street. I was the new car salesman. He was the used car salesman. And no, I was finance manager, whatever it was. Anyway, he was trying to get me fired. And so he was actually stealing radios out of cars and putting them in the, in the drawer in my desk. And I found these radios there before the owner did. And I went to him. I said, because I asked around, did anybody see who put these radios in my desk? Well, I saw Charlie Bulanga in there. So I went to him and I said, Charlie, I know you don't like me, but are you actually doing this? And he goes, Yeah, I want you out. I mean, eyes wide open, you're telling me that you're framing me. Yes. So I want you out. I said, Oh, Charlie. Charlie, please don't do this. He goes, I want you out. I said, no, that's, that's not me. I'm concerned about Charlie. My father is going to be very angry. And he owns the dealership. Your father is Gene Horn? No, my father is the father of Gene Horn. Please, Charlie. I mean, I was actually concerned for him. I wasn't worried about, was I going to lose my job? Look, I'm a child of God. You, you're you like cats. You always land on your feet. I was worried about him because he did not have the covering of the blood of Jesus over him. And my father was angry. And I, can I tell you what happened? I didn't have to defend myself. I just kept praying for Charlie, but to no avail. He was taken out. He was taken out. I'll tell you in a minute how it happened. See, I can leave it at the feet and I can start, I can leave my problem at the feet of God and start focusing on his problem. He's lost. I may lose a job, but he's going to lose his soul. Suddenly you find yourself praying, God, be a little more patient. Just wait a little longer, Lord. You go in with this hurt and this, this, how could this happen? I'm living righteously. How did this happen? Why am I accused? And you come out going, oh God, it's not about me. It's about you and your name and about him and his condition. His focus was adjusted. It went from a vision of his own injury to suddenly his eyes were filled with the majesty of God whose, whose train filled the temple. He went in weak. He walks out on fire. This is how you are to deal with it. This is how you are to deal with slander. Go to God in prayer and let him adjust your vision. Verse 12 of Psalm 7, David says, If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapon, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into that hole that he has made. Suddenly, as I, as I stand before the throne of God and I see the bow is bent and the target is lined up and his fingers are about to let fly, I find myself saying, wait, hang on God, wait. Wait just a moment. Let me go and talk to him one more time. Get out of the way, Randy. He has insulted my son. Get out of the way. Wait, wait. Just a moment.
In verse 16 it says, His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. Listen to these words. You can be sure God will vindicate you and the sinner will reap his own harvest. You can be sure. There's a very interesting book in the Bible, the book of Esther. The reason why I say it's interesting is because it's one book in the Bible that not one time is God mentioned in the whole book. Not one time is he mentioned. And yet, in the book of Esther, you can see God more clearly than, in my opinion, any other book in the Bible except perhaps Mark. He's never mentioned. But you see him beside, behind the scenes arranging things. And remember that Haman, this great enemy of the Jewish people and accuser of Mordecai, builds a gallow and he's proud of high, how high it is. Huh? Who did the final dance on the gallow, Mordecai or Haman who had built it? Haman. You can be sure. They fall by their own hand. That actually is the arrow that God looses. There's a sense of poetic justice in the way God brings things about. So what happened to Charlie Buhanda? One day... Gene Horn was walking and just kind of looking around the dealership and walked in. He had no idea that there was even a conflict between I and Charlie. And he walked into Charlie's office and he found so many things stolen. And he found so much evidence of, of him selling this stuff to wholesalers. The next thing I knew, Charlie was just gone. Hung on his own gallows. And so then David is able to now say these last words in verse 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. Now, I want to give your choice between two jobs. All right, you get to pick. I'm going to give you a choice. You can have either one of these jobs. One of these jobs is that every time you get slandered, you spend all of the time defending yourself, trying to explain how you are righteous in this. You spend your time trying to protect yourself, making sure that nobody can accuse you. You make sure that everybody knows how innocent you are. You spend your time doing that. You can let it go. And spend your time giving thanks and praise to God. Which job would you like to have? Can I tell you the job that you have been given? The job that he gave you was not about defending yourself. The job he gave you is for you to give thanks and praise God for the rest of your life. Well, if I do that, then who's going to take care of this? If I focus on giving thanks to God and praising him, who's going to do this? Where do you think the source of your thanks and praise comes from? Watching him do that. Suddenly you're going, God is my defender. God is my shield. How amazing. I could have never done it as good as that. One of you is going to defend yourself. Which one do you want it to be? Because he's not going to compete with you. Oh, I want God to defend me. Now David, as soon as it hits, David does exactly what David is supposed to do and what has been made available for every one of us. You hear the news. I'm in trouble. I have been accused. The man in power is coming for my head. I'm in trouble. I'm going to go talk to God. And when I go to God, I'm able to say, Hey! You made some promises. Do you see what they're saying? Are you awake? That seems kind of rude, doesn't it? Let me show you something. Would you look with me to Mark chapter 5? See, some of you may be saying, 
I'm not David. I don't know that I could just walk into the court of the king like that. I want to reveal to you something about our God's nature. Okay? Mark chapter 5. Have you got it there? Verses 25. I think we're in following. It says, And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now let's talk about this for a moment. According to the word of God, according to the law of God, because she had an issue of blood, she was declared by God to be one of the unclean. The law says she is unclean. She's not allowed to come to the temple of God to worship. Did you know that? She is unclean. She's one of those. But now here is God himself walking in a crowd. And this unclean person pushes her way right through the crowd and touches him. Should have been struck by lightning, right? How dare an unclean person even think to lay hands on the hem of God's garment? And what is God's response to this flagrant, outrageous assumption? He heals her. Because he likes it. He likes it. See, this is a physical thing that happened, but it has it, it teaches us a strong spiritual lesson. What is it that made her acceptable to him? How could she, an unclean person, be acceptable to him? He tells you. He says, your faith has done this. As she's pressing in, as she's moving, she is losing the uncleanliness. Why? Because of her faith. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm coming to Him. By the time you get to Him, your faith has cleansed you. She touches the hem of His garment and immediately the issue of blood stops. Immediately. Let's continue with the story. Look at what it says. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? The disciple said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She knows according to the law I'm not supposed to do this. And so she comes. He says, who touched me? Oh no, now I'm going to get killed. I dared to come into God's presence. Who touched me? With fear she comes, because she doesn't know the secret yet. She says, I did it. Look at what Jesus answers her. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of all your your diseases. God likes it. In fact, let me share a couple other verses with you real quick. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Jesus said these words, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it 
by force. What, what, that seems kind of odd. Now look at Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Not just a woman with an issue of blood, but tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes were all forcing their way close to him. One day, in fact, as he was teaching, they tore a roof off and lowered a sinner right down in front of him. No matter where he went, sinners were pressing in upon him. They were violently coming to the kingdom. He liked it. In fact, when the Pharisees said, how can you let these sinners come in here? What are you doing? How, how can you do this? If you only knew. And he's going, this is why I came. This is why I came. In fact, he tells a parable. I won't do the whole parable. Let's just look at the verse at the end, Matthew 21, 31. He tells a parable about two sons. One was a good son. He was really good. The father said, would you go work in the field? And the good son said, oh, yes, daddy. I'll do everything you say. But he never went. And the other one was a tax collector and prostitute. And said, will you work in the field? No, I'm not going to work in the field. I'm going to go collect tax taxes and prostitute. But later they changed their mind. And they went and worked in the field. And so Jesus asked this question, which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first, Jesus said, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Why do I bring this up? We're talking about David has this ability that when, that when he's in trouble, he just walks right into his father's house. And you may be thinking, well, that's David because he's the king of Israel, but look at me, Randy. I don't have it all together. I'm struggling with every part of life. I can't just go to God the way David can. And he's saying, come. Come. Look at Matthew 11, 28. The words of Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, you may be going, shouldn't that woman have waited upon an invitation? Shouldn't she kind of approach Jesus from a distance and said, Lord, may I come? Friends, the invitation has already been given, and it reverberates throughout all of history. The Lord Jesus Christ has invited any who will may come. Every one of you, if you come through Christ in faith the way that woman came, every one of you is welcomed right into his presence. In fact, I just want to conclude with this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7, or 17. The Spirit and the Bride, that's the church. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. The invitation is, it's a written invitation. Have you ever heard that? Well, do you need a written invitation? You have one. In gold, if that makes you feel better. You, whoever you are, that you feel like you're on the outside, you can come and have the exact same access that David had and that every saint of God come, has. You just have to come by faith through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross. And you will be welcomed. And all of these promises and God's defense will be yours as well. I'm going to ask the worship team to come very quietly.
And as they're coming and making their way up here, I'm going to ask everyone in the congregation, would you please stand if you are able? <clears throat> 